of minutes to get started here. Uh, people are still being uh, helped in order to get online and people are still joining. But we will be kicking off in a moment. Uh, Civic Secretary General Dani Siriskandaraja is going to be giving our welcomes. And then Board Secretary and Chair of Publish What You Pay, uh, Elisa Sapita is going to be our moderator. They'll be starting in just a moment. So I'm going to ask for just one or two minutes of patience. Um, hello everyone, it's Danny Sriskandaraja. On behalf of colleagues at Civicus, thank you very much for joining this webinar. It's always a very busy but exciting time of the year for us when we publish our flagship publication, the State of Civil Society Report, which as you know was out um, just over a day ago. And we wanted to hold a, a discussion like this to allow some of our members to have a, a more in-depth discussion about some of the findings and recommendations in, in the report. As always, uh, the report consists of guest contributions from our members and partners. And this year, we have 27 fantastic contributions. And as always, we have a, a year in review where we look at the state of civil society, conditions for civil society around the world. And I urge you to, to engage with lots and lots of material, including this year for the first time, evidence and data drawn from our Civicus Monitor. I suspect most of you will know and be sadly too familiar with the deteriorating conditions for civil society around the world, what my colleagues call a global emergency on civic space. But we wanted to spend this webinar looking at this year's thematic focus, which has been to look at civil society and the private sector. And we did that for several reasons. Um, we chose this topic because, of course, there's no denying that the, that the private sector is playing an increasing role in almost every aspect of our lives, including aspects that we thought were once left to the, what we used to call the state or, or, um, or, or civil society. And in fact, as noted in the report, most of the 100 largest economies in the world are businesses, not states. So for those of us in civil society who want to pursue social change and social transformation, we can't ignore the, civil, uh, the private sector. And in many cases, uh, we're already working in one way or another with the private sector. So this year's report was an attempt to take stock of, of how that relationship is working out, get, get different perspectives on, on the relationship between civil society and business. And in particular, focus on two issues. One is the business case for civic space. Of course, governments are responsible for the vast majority of restrictions on civic space. But in too many cases, businesses are standing by idly or in some case colluding with political elites to shut down dissent and citizen action. And so we wanted to look at what more business should be doing to protect conditions for civil society. And of course, the second reason is around how business and civil society can work together to pursue a, a positive agenda on sustainable development, especially at a time when too many leaders, too many governments are failing to live up to their commitments on sustainable development. So this year's report, as always, is full of lots and lots of information. And I'm delighted we have this chance to talk with members and others about uh, some of the, the essays, the contributions, the, the lessons and, and recommendations. This is primarily a, a member based event. Um, it will be recorded so that it'll be put up later um, on our YouTube channel. Um, those of you who are online and on, on uh, social media, please do use the uh, SOCS hashtag. So hashtag socks state of civil society uh, when you're having a conversation online about uh, about this event or indeed any other aspect of the report. And if you're on Twitter, please do make sure you tag uh, our civics account at Civicus Alliance. So without further ado, um, I'm delighted to hand over to uh, 
to Elisa Peter, whose day job is, uh, is as Executive Director of Publish What You Pay, an incredibly important network and initiative um, devoted to transparency, uh, particularly in, um, in some key sectors. But um, she also happens to be an active and important member of the Board of Directors of Civicus, elected by our members, um, and in fact has been the Secretary of our Board for the last few years. So um, for both of those uh, roles, um, we're delighted to be working with Elisa, and I'm happy to hand over to Elisa, who's going to moderate the rest of this webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure and, and a, a great honor to moderate uh, this webinar in conjunction with the launch of the 2017 Civic State of Civil Society Report. And I must say that as a Civic Board member, I have uh, witnessed over the past few years um, how those, those reports are becoming um, more and more authoritative. And I think the quality of this year's report is exceptional. So I really encourage everyone to have a look at the report. Uh, it is available on the Civicus homepage as of yesterday. And just to complement what uh, Danny just said, um, Publish What You Pay members have over the past 15 years um, engaged with the extractive sector to fight corruption in the oil, gas, and mining sector. So um, we do bring some um, um, experience of the, the complex relationships that civil society organizations often have with um, the private sector. So before I, I dwell more specifically in, into the report and give the floor to our um, guest authors, I just want to remind people of a few housekeeping issues. So uh, the first one is that I'll hold questions until um, everybody, all the presenters have had a chance to speak. So you're able to ask your questions in the chat box, um, which you can access uh, um, by clicking on the speech bubble at the bottom left of the window of your Skype for Business um, window. Um, and please mute yourselves uh, so that we we can um, we can hear the speakers more clearly. So um, this year's civil state of civil society report, uh, as Danny um, uh, explained, is as two different parts. The first part is as usual. Um, a, the year in review, um, which kind of looks at the major trends in civic space around the world. And this year it um, uh, depicts a rather grim picture, um, showing how only 3% of the world's citizens live in countries where civic space is fully open. Um, another um, reflection of this year's report is how the rise of populist regimes around the world have contributed to an increasing pushback against independent civil society voices and independent journalists. Um, but it also showcases examples of how civil society organizations, including civicus members, are finding innovative ways to, to fight back. Um, the other part of the report is focused on this year's um, theme, which is civil society organizations and the private sector. And looking at the growing power and influence of companies and how this is affecting fundamental freedoms of association, of um, expression, of peaceful assembly, and also how in some cases it is associated uh, with gross human rights abuses. Um, why focus on the private sector? So Danny started explaining why we've chosen this theme this year. Um, concern about the reach of global, global corporations is nothing new. So David Corton in his book, uh, When Corporations Rule the World, which was published in 1995, so some 20 years ago, um, already described how the, the global consolidation of corporate power um, has affected uh, politics and the global economy. 
um, often in in ways that have been detrimental to a people's focused and equitable development agenda. And before him, in, in the mid-19th century, Abraham Lincoln already lamented how corporations, and I quote, had been enthroned and that an era of corruption in high places would follow, aggregating wealth in a few hands and destroying the republic in its wake. So that was mid-19th century. So what is new is the scale and the urgency of the issue. And as Gretchen Gordon says in her essay on development and human rights, FDI, so foreign direct investment in developing countries, is now five times larger than official development assistance. And it often focuses on large infrastructure projects, which are not often in line with, with the needs of local communities. Another trend that's accelerating is that people who question, question um, this, this type of uh, corporate-led development are increasingly at risk and under threat, uh, ranging from intimidation, violence, and even murder. So it's been 20 years now that Ken Sarariwa was murdered in the Niger Delta for um, uh, opposing uh, Shell's oil development in his ancestral lands, um, and hundreds of activists who are questioning uh, companies' role in development have since then been murdered, with Berta Caceres, and we mentioned her a few times in the report, being one of the last or latest um, high-level uh, casualties. Uh, of, of uh, people um, confronting um, uh, powerful corporations, uh, especially in the area of natural resource exploitation. So Michael Eineken, Anas Bona, and Maurizio Lazzala show in their uh, contribution that over 400 cases of attacks against human rights defenders in 2015 and 2016 have been made in the context of opposition to specific companies or industrial sectors. So that's what a, the challenging part of the equation. But on the other hand, the private sector has and can be a positive force for change when companies decide to forcibly uh, stand up for open and democratic societies um, and to defend those people um, and, and citizens expressing dissent. So, Uwe Gneiting says in his essay that civil society's ambivalence regarding the role and the responsibility of the private sector is not new, but indeed synergies can be leveraged, and there are successful examples of constructive engagement to be found, for instance, in the labor movement, in the climate change movement, or in the fair trade movement. And increasingly, international um, uh, initiatives, international organizations like the UN, the World Economic Forum, are increasingly stressing the role of business in protecting civic space and human rights. So um, while the question of engaging the private sector remains one of the most uh, contentious questions uh, among civil society, what our report shows is that we, as civil society players, really need to start having a more sophisticated and nuanced conversation about how we can engage with companies uh, and the private sector in general to bring about positive social change. So let me now turn to our um, presenters. We're privileged and lucky to have five of the authors who contributed to this year's report. Um, and we will be um, talking about four of the guest essays in the report. So uh, we'll be talking about the role of business in protecting human rights defenders. We'll be talking about the business impacts on human rights. Then we'll turn to the private sector and its role in implementing the sustainable development goals over the coming years. And finally, the private sector and more generally its role in international development, including um, in terms of um, financing uh, for development. But before I turn to those guest authors, let me first turn to um, the editor and lead author of their report, Andrew Furman, um, 
and he will touch upon some of the key trends and highlights of um, the report. So, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm just uh, turning on my video. There we go. Hi, everyone. So I'm Andrew. I'm, uh, as Elisa said, I'm the author and editor of uh, the State of Civil Society report. And what I want to do is just share with you some of the key thematic trends that emerge from this report. Now, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and show you a PowerPoint presentation. So let's see if this works. Uh, good. OK, so I hope people can see the PowerPoint presentation that's on my screen. Uh, and I really just want to talk through uh, what the report is and what uh, we're saying about this key theme of civil society in the private sector. So this is an annual report we produce um, on uh, the health and state of civil society. It comes from civil society. Almost all the authors are from civil society. Uh, it's based on a wide range of consultations and interviews with civil society activists, people close to the main stories of the day. Uh, the report both looks at uh, recent events, how civil society has been involved in them, how they have impacted on civil society. And each year we have a special theme. So as is obvious, this year's theme is civil society in the private sector. Next year we're looking at the question of reimagining, reinventing democracy. So a lot of this has been touched on already by Danny and Elisa, but, but, but why we want to address this issue and why now? Um, we know, you know, as Danny said, uh, most of the world's uh, 100th biggest economies are now companies rather than uh, uh, states, you know, and if you look at how the world's changed in, in the 25 years that Civicus has existed, that's a big change. You know, the private sector has its increasing reach, not just in economic life, but in political life, in, in social and cultural life, in international governance. Uh, development policies, you'll hear from some of the um, presenters is increasingly oriented around enabling private sector growth. Um, this is a change for civil society. If you, as I say, if you look back over the 25 years since Civicus was founded, uh, civil society has traditionally focused its advocacy attempts, its accountability work, its oversight on the state. You know, it's been, pre we've pre been preoccupied over the last 25 years with the question of civil society's relation with, with the state. So what might we need to do differently as civil society to engage with this rising power, greater prominence, increasing role of the private sector uh, in our lives. That's very much the starting point for uh, our consideration of the theme in this year's report. And I hope you'll go to the website, engage with the 27 uh, n brand new, specially commissioned articles on different aspects of the theme of civil society and the private sector. You'll hear from some of the presenters after me. but. What I want to say is when we put all those 27 together and uh, uh, the various other research inputs into this report, what does that picture seem to be saying as a whole about uh, what's happening, how civil society is responding, what we could do differently? <laughs> so again, we've touched on this, why it matters, why this rising power is impacting on human rights and on the space for civil society, both directly and indirectly. Uh, in terms of the space for civil society, what Civicus calls civic space, this is defined by uh, the extent to which free fundamental rights uh, are realized and enabled. And those are the rights to association, peaceful assembly and free expression. Now, the Civicus monitor, something that Danny mentioned, which is an online platform that tracks the space for civil society in every country of the world, that makes clear that the main uh, source of challenges to civic space, the main sources of restrictions on civil, civil society, is still the state. But over the last couple of years, we've become increasingly aware of rising civil society concern about the impacts of the private sector on their space, on their ability to operate, on their ability to act. And there's a particular challenge because there, often, there tends to be impunity for a lot of attacks that the private sector might make, particularly when the private se sector is working closely with states and with political elites. So this seems to be to, to us and our contributors a rising challenge that we need to address. Uh, so that's the first part of the report when we look at what seems to be the problem, the rise in prominence of uh, the private sector and particularly the impacts that this can have on civil society. 
But you also in the report, we want to, we spend most of our time uh, not so much diagnosing the problem as trying to understand how civil society is responding and how, how those responses can be enabled. I'm going to talk uh, in a moment about a couple of specific responses that we're particularly interested in as, as an alliance at Civicus. But uh, the report sets out a range of responses which are about distinguishing the best and worst business practice, trying to work positively with businesses that are engaging in the best practice, while also calling out the worst practice of businesses. They're trying to work with the public, that are trying to work through campaigns, they're trying to influence consumers using shareholder action, divestment policies, uh, litigation in some cases, um, and that are about uh, trying to work with business leaders, work with business networks. So, you know, what I'd encourage you to see is there's a range of possible civil society tools and responses uh, in engaging with the private sector. There's, there's a spectrum of responses, but there's always a need to, for a nuanced approach that understands the best and worst of what businesses are capable of and is able to distinguish between those two. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, a couple of responses we're particularly interested in at Civicus. Danny already mentioned the business case for civic space. The, uh, one of Civicus's core concerns is the space for civil society, civic space. So. Uh, how can businesses be persuaded to uphold, defend, enable civic space? Uh, and we believe there's a need to assert that um, civic space is a fundamental part of the upholding the rule of law, which is something most businesses tell us that they need. You know, in order to operate, businesses need predictability. Uh, they need laws to be uh, followed. They need um, they need to be able to make long-term investment uh, decisions in confidence. Uh, grand corruption, which happens without the rule of law, is for most businesses a bad thing as to the cost of businesses. Now, you can't have the rule of law without accountability, and you can't have accountability without civil society. So if you want the rule of law to uh, exist, then you need to uphold and enable civic space. We want businesses to commit to a first do no harm principle to civil society. This should be the absolute and fundamental bottom line. Uh, in this uh, relation, in this emerging and changing relationship between private sector and the civil society, the private sector should commit to first do no harm to civil society. But beyond that, we need active support. There are examples out there of how businesses have uh, actively engaged in support in civil society. Um, they show that um, relationships developed over time can help. The existence of business networks and civil society networks can help. Engagement with business leaders by civil society can help. So there is, I think, emerging discourse over the last couple of years, an emerging body of evidence on how the business case for civic space can be made. But it's still not enough. There aren't enough examples. There aren't enough active businesses. Um, uh, there needs to be more of this. Now, the other key response we're interested in at Civicus, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Civicus uh, has a big interest in how, uh, in how civil society can participate in international governance and how international governance can be used as a, a, a locus where progressive norms are, are developed, uh, uh, established and disseminated. And this is another growing area that we're interested in and where we think there's potential for more civil society engagement. Um, at the UN level, there is the, there are now the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, there's also uh, engagement towards uh, developing a new treaty on holding transnational business to human rights norms. We think at Civicus this is a good thing. Uh, that process is now three years old. Uh, it was, yeah, 2014, the uh, UN Human Rights Council in Geneva agreed to set up a working group to develop such a treaty. We think this is a good thing because there's an obvious gap in international human rights law that's been created by the, by the rising uh, role of businesses. And, you know, we think uh, there's a need for both voluntary and mandatory mechanisms of compliance. Uh, this will help with uh, this will help civil society to exercise accountability, uh, hold businesses to norms and standards and ratchet up good behavior, uh, uh, gradually uh, improve practice. Now, this process, you know, won't be easy to develop this treaty. It's uh, past evidence tells us that civil society engagement and action can be crucial. We saw that in the past in things like the Landmines Treaty and the treaty that established the International Criminal Court. 
So we think there's a need for broader uh, and deeper and more diverse civil society engagement in this process. And then when a treaty is eventually arrived at, there's a need for civil society activity to ensure that it's domesticated, to ensure that the treaty applies in, in each uh, country of the world. So those are two key response areas that uh, Civicus is particularly interested in coming out of this report, um, making the business case for civil spa civic space on the one hand, and developing uh, stronger international norms on the other. Uh, and then in the final part of the report, we also look at the question of partnership. You know, this um, uh, the question of how civil society and, and the private sector can partner, but beyond uh, public relations, beyond the soft stuff, and beyond the um, charitable and financial support. We, we need to go further than that. We need to acknowledge scepticism in civil society about partnerships. We need to acknowledge that partnerships rarely uh, enable the, what we call the disruptive work of civil society, civil society's engagement to defend human rights, to civil society's engagement to advance uh, advocacy, to engage in accountability. Uh, we also need to respect that um, civil society is diverse. Uh, some civil society uh, groups, organizations, actors uh, really don't want to engage with the private sector. We have to respect that. The diversity of civil society is a great strength. But civil society as a whole needs to uh, needs to think about how it can engage differently, how it can develop a nuanced approach, how it can uh, have partnerships that distinguish between good and bad corporate behavior, and how partnerships can enable us in civil society to achieve impact, uh, to improve our reach. Part of that is in civil society, we uh, ourselves may need to make new connections and build new networks. You know, we there are some uh, people in civil society, some groups and organizations that are very active on this agenda. And that includes some of the people we're going to hear from after me. But uh, we still think there's a need to uh, broaden the network, cast the net wider, bring a wider range of civil society into working on issues around the private sector. Um, any partnership must be underpinned by some key principles, and we set these out in, uh, at the end of the report. And, you know, those principles may include principles of trust, mutual respect, equality, honesty, transparency is everything. Uh, whatever we do, uh, this is an area of emerging practice. It's a rapidly changing field as, as business goes into new arenas and continues to grow. And we need to learn from everything we do. So I think I just want to leave it there. Now, that's obviously a big picture uh, overview, and the contributors after me are going to drill down on some of these issues. And again, I encourage people to visit our website, uh, engage with the re report, and uh, and share their own learning with us uh, on these issues. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for this um uh, broad yet insightful uh, presentation of this year's um, report on the state of civil society. Uh, we're going to now turn to some of the authors of the report uh, who we are lucky were able to join us today. Um, but before I turn to them, I just wanted to remind participants that they're more than welcome to start asking questions in the conversation box as those questions pop up in your mind. And I will uh, come back to them at the very end of the presentations in about half an hour. So I'm now turning to Anna um, Sbona and Michael Eineken, um, who co-wrote uh, the paper in the report on human rights defenders under attack, the role of business in protecting their space. Um, Anna leads the Civic Freedom and Human Rights Defenders Project at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center in London. And Michael is the Director of Human Rights Council uh, Advocacy with the International Service for Human Rights. Um, so I'll turn to both of them now for a few minutes to look at specifically again um, the role of business in protecting uh, uh, human rights defenders. Thank you, Lisa. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, can you hear me? Y yes, we can hear can you, but we can't see you. Sorry. 
Ah, now we can see you, but we cannot. Sorry, we can hear you, but we cannot see you. You cannot see. Yes. Can you see me now? Uh... <laughs> yes. Now we can see you. All right. Um, thank you so much, um, as, as Elisa said, I'm from Business and Human Rights Resource Center. It's a huge pleasure and an honor to be here and to be able to touch on this topic. I'll do my best to, to give us an overview of our guest expert. We wrote with Ice Guitar. So I will be on the more negative uh, aspect to attacks on defenders and the role of business in that, while Michael from ICHR will touch upon the examples of encouraging practice of business and defenders cooperating after me. So as we know, oh, I'm told to speak closer to the mic. I think this is better. I will continue, hopefully you can hear me, but otherwise let me know. Um, as we know, in the context of business activities, defenders play a very crucial role. As the Working Group on Business and Human Rights has been emphasizing more and more, the guiding principles recognize this. In Principle 18, which urges businesses to consult them and highlights their role, the risks faced by them are highlighted through Principle 26 which had commentary to it, which required states to ensure their legitimate activities are not obstructed. The UN also developed the concept of safe and enabling environment for defenders, which is the benchmark against which states and businesses should implement their human rights obligations and responsibilities. In spite of these, however, uh, civil society at large is under attack and defenders who raise concerns about specific companies and sectors are increasingly under attack and some of the most at risk. As Elisa said, the Resource Center's new portal and database, with uh, some cases have been added in the past few months since the writing of the essay, there are now at least 460 cases of attacks against these defenders in 2015 and 2016. Most were connected to extractives and energy sectors, followed by agribusiness. In order, in over a quarter of cases, they were related to companies that were headquartered in China, the United States, and Canada. Six out of the most dangerous countries were in Latin America, even though this could be connected to underreporting in some parts of the world. Um, criminalization was found to be the most common form of attack, which was often preceded by a period of defamation and attack on resources by individuals and organizations. There were, there were at least 67 cases where companies were directly involved, mostly lawsuits against defenders. These lawsuits happened in most sectors and often include charges of defamation. And just yesterday, an important case of this kind began in Thai courts. Defenders sometimes sue companies back, as was mentioned, though this is often lengthy and costly. Recent examples include Andy Ho in Thailand and Kalas in Guatemala. So in our essay, we try to look at, try to look at some of the drivers of this situation. So obviously, the incentive structures of many companies continue to be focused on short-term benefits with most markets and many investors still rewarding companies on the basis of short-term success rather than long-term sustainability, especially when governments lack the will and frameworks to defend defenders or set the wrong incentives for business that can lead companies to continue disavowing their responsibilities, which then leads to um, resistance by local communities, by defenders, and subsequently to retaliation, repression, and violence against the HRDs, which often goes uninvestigated, unreported, unpunished, and thus fuels uh, continued violence. So states obviously have the primary obligation to ensure rights of defenders, but in our essay, we highlighted some cases where this is actually turned on its head and states are pushing some companies to criminalize defenders. Uh, that the state itself wants to silence, uh, which is the case of some indigenous defenders in Russia. We also stressed that sometimes dynamics of business seem to lead to crackdown. So some companies still perceive critics 
being silenced as a short-term benefit, especially if they experience pressure from investors to continue and deliver results in spite of resistance. Sometimes dynamics between suppliers and brands can also incentivize crackdown as suppliers are pressured into meeting demands at low cost. Finally, we drew attention to the extractive sector, which our research confirmed to be the most dangerous sector for defenders working on business and human rights. So in some expectations of companies with regard to defenders need to be clarified at all levels. We need leadership by industry champions, as was mentioned by Andrew, but also appropriate laws, monitoring, regulating of business. Uh, these are all important. Um, these are all important to disincentivize effects. It's also really important for government buyers, investors, and also customers to incentivize those suppliers and those companies that are not only engaging positively with defenders, but protecting civic freedoms uh, and civic space more broadly. And um, many of them are starting to do that. And I'll let Michael discuss that part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you to Civicus for uh, both inviting us uh, to contribute uh, a guest essay on on, uh, on this joint project of ISHR and the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, but also uh, for inviting us to this webinar. Um, uh, uh, much has already been said by Andrew and then, uh, and also Anna, and so my task is is relatively easy, and I look forward to the, the conversation afterwards as well. Anna um, kind of advertised my part of, of uh, speaking to our, our collective essay as giving you positive examples. Now, at the outset, I just want to kind of put the, the positive in, in uh, big inverted commas, because as uh, all the speakers before me have, have said, the, the situation of human rights defenders who confront uh, business interests or who, who raise their voice uh, in relation to development or, or business projects is is dire. The Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders has said that they are among the mo among those defenders that are most at risk. Um, and you, many of you will be aware that he's currently drafting a specific report looking at the situation of defenders working in the area of business and human rights. And so speaking of, of positive development in, in, in that regard, is is kind of clutching uh, the the straws that we have, um, and so for ISHR this is very much a, a a tactical choice to to do. We very much acknowledge and and are aware of the the, the severity of the risks that human rights defenders face, and so highlighting positive um, the few positive examples uh, in no way uh, wants to turn a blind eye to to the, the to that attack. Um, that's also indicated in the way that we framed um, those positive developments in, in our essay. You will see that um, the essay talks about a growing sensitivity about uh, among business and, and, and uh, business uh, actors um, uh, to the situation of civil society and human rights defenders. We're, we're absolutely not there yet. There is there's still a, a long way to go. For, for companies to really help respond and, and become an ally in defending the, the civic space, um, uh, to use the civicus uh, terminology. So there's a growing, uh, the growing sensitivity. That's exemplified, um, for instance, by the, uh, the recent inclusion, and I know there's a specific essay as well in the article, uh, in the uh, SOX about the corporate human rights benchmark, but by the inclusion of a um, a specific indicator in the corporate human rights benchmarks which looks at whether or not a company has a policy to protect human rights defenders. Um, again, policies will never never do the job completely, but we see them as, as a, a first step to really bring business, um, raise the awareness among companies that human rights defenders are actually key allies and should be protected and not, not the contrary. Um, there are a couple of companies that have already acted um, and anticipated the, um, uh, the corporate human rights benchmark in that regard, such as Adidas that has uh, uh, adopted the first policy on human rights defenders with its limitations and with, with the 
the kind of the proof of of its effectiveness still to to be made but there is a, there is a policy the same goes for Marx and Spencer and the Haynes brands um, which we, we see as steps in the right direction um, when we when it comes to kind of specific action uh, of companies in defense of civic space and 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 human rights defenders I think the examples are are even scarcer um, they're examples that will not be new to, to any, uh, I guess, of the, the participants on this call, um, because as I said, there, 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 there are very few of them. Um, and so what we're trying to do is trying to learn from them. The two kind of um, flagship examples that I want to highlight here um, are the engagement of a, a range of garment sector uh, and, and global apparel companies in relation to the, the protest um, and the, the crackdown on, on uh, protesting workers in Cambodia um, about three years ago. In, in this example, the, the garment brands wrote, intervened with the uh, Prime Minister of, of Cambodia to request that police stop cracking down on peacefully protesting workers. Um, with the, the rationale, and that's also further developed um, in, in, the, in our essay and in, in our work, with the rationale, there's actually a business case for a, an environment that is open and uh, safe for human rights defenders and, and civil society to express their views. And that such environments are also more stable, they're more predictable for businesses, and therefore are preferable to those where dissent is, is repressed. The other key example um, is that of Rafael Marquez, a, an award-winning Angolan journalist who wrote about the corruption in the diamond industry. Um, and as a result, uh, through a combination of, of uh, business interests and, and state interest, was facing criminalization lawsuits. Um, in this case, a, a range of leading diamond companies uh, wrote a public letter uh, requesting that the case be dropped. And we feel that this has been a, a significant contribution to that case actually being dropped. So these are, are, are some of the, the, the kind of the, the examples that we've seen in terms of the actual behavior of, of companies to start defending um, uh, human rights defenders and, and civic freedoms. Uh, Anna has already spoken about what, what kind of some of the, the key features of, of uh, um, uh, the, the, the next steps in that regard are, are uh, and, and our, our essay outlines that in, in more detail. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll stop here and uh, look forward to the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, we are running a little bit behind schedule, so if I could please ask the following presenters to keep it to keep their presentations to under five minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. So. We're now moving on to um, Adam Shapiro. So Adam is the head of communications and visibility with Frontline Defenders, an international human rights organization working um, for the security and protection of human rights defenders worldwide. And we at Publish What You Pay have definitely um, used uh, their services and support uh, many times when some of our activists were um, under under threat, being jailed or, or harassed. Um, so Adam will present um, the guest essay entitled Changing the Calculation, International Business Impacts on Human Rights. Adam, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me and uh, as well see me. Um, I first want to thank, of course, uh, Civicus and specifically Andrew, uh, Sarah, and Michael, who's uh, for both the publication and, and arranging for me to be on the call. Um, it's it's quite early where I am, so uh, <laughs> I thank you for waking me up uh, quite early. Um, a lot of what has been already said uh, certainly provide, provides context for my presentation and, and my essay, um, which looks at trying to f understand and, and propose that there is actually a business case potentially, or there should be, um, for businesses, investors, and in this case I'm thinking about big multinational banks, uh, investment banks, um, IFIs, 
um, that are investing in mega projects or development projects around the world, which is where within the space of environmental rights, land rights defenders, we see particularly related to some of these mega projects and extractive projects, um, defenders who are facing the most risk. And in this case, the most risk really is physical violence and killing. Um, the ultimate example, of course, being uh, the case of Bertha Cafetis, as was mentioned already, but we have unfortunately too many other cases um, each year in an increasing number of defenders who are working on, on land and environmental issues, uh, often going up against corporate interests uh, involving these big projects. Um, in, tw in 2016, just to give you an example, Frontline Defenders uh, documented about 280, well, 281 killings we documented, although we know there are more, um, about half of which were of defenders dealing with land and environmental issues. Um, and as we move forward, we are actually trying to change the way we calculate these killings to understand which events, which incidents directly involve uh, projects uh, involving business, involving IFIs, uh, and different kinds of institutions like this, so that we can more accurately pinpoint the impact of business and investment projects on, uh, on human rights defenders. So the calculation that I'm trying to look at uh, hit me, really struck me when I was, uh, when Bertha was killed, and uh, also when uh, Siko Sifi uh, Radobe in uh, South Africa, another uh, environmental activist, land rights and community rights activist who was killed um, and who had been put on a hit list, actually, uh, and then subsequently was killed uh, because of his work. In both of these cases, we saw businesses, in this case investment banks, um, make public announcements after great pressure brought by international solidarity efforts, as well as local organizing efforts within Honduras and South Africa in the respective cases. We saw these uh, corporate actors, and I'm using corporate in a very wide sense here, uh, we saw these corporate actors move to withdraw support for the projects that they were supporting. And in this case, it was not the companies directly involved, but actually the, the, investment, the investors in the projects behind them. Now, the extent to which they've moved to withdraw is certainly still a question, and, and the recent article in The Guardian about Bertha's case indicates that there is, you know, perhaps some wavering or that sustained pressure is what's really needed, and perhaps even more publicly sh public shaming is, is what's needed in order to ensure that we see full consequences and withdrawal for the killing of these, HR these human rights defenders. But what struck me was that it didn't have to wait until each of these people were killed and, and others are killed for companies to take action, for uh, the investors to take action, or for them to have the information to the point where they could understand that they had a business interest in not continuing to fund, not continuing to support these projects, unless there were safety measures, uh, precautions, regulations put in place to ensure the safety and security of the human rights defenders who are working to confront and challenge uh, these projects for, for the various reasons that they were doing so, whether they had to do with land rights or environmental issues or community rights, whatever. The reason is this. In, in all the cases that, uh, of killings that we see uh, of human rights defenders, or almost all of them, uh, particularly related to environmental and land rights issues involving corporates, we find that there are often an escalating, there are escalating measures. As has earlier been mentioned by Anna, she mentioned defamation, there's criminalization, there's threats that are often made, some of which go unreported, certainly, but many of which do get reported and documented. And it's almost, in a sense, a roadmap towards violence that we, that we can trace out uh, of human rights defenders who experience these things. And, and that information, we certainly, as frontline defenders, and we know our partners in civil society, we make that known. We make that public. And often our advocacy and effort is aimed towards governments. And, and one of the things that this is all about, this uh, effort with Civicus here, is to point at private sector. Certainly, that's that's where this is this is going. Um, but what what this pri what we need to understand is that for the banks, for the investors, for the corporates, although they might have short-term corporate interests, uh, certainly at the forefront of their thinking, part of their thinking also has to do with in terms of how they line up their corporate interests or how they line up their uh, their involvement in a project and, and weighing the pros and cons is 
when they get bad publicity and when that bad publicity leads to pressure and when that pressure leads to public outrage and media attention and all the other kinds of things that we use to in terms of visibility to bring attention to a situation to campaign about a situation too often this is men waiting or or not being able to make that effective until after violence has occurred until after a killing has occurred but as i outlined in the article uh that calculation can change. The, the, perpetrator, the people on the ground who carry out these acts of violence, whoever they are, often make calculations because they're operating in an environment in which there, let's face it, there is impunity. Um, and despite our best efforts, we find that uh, impunity is not only something that continues to exist, it seems to be actually expanding as part of this expansion of shrinking space of civil society. If it's the case that we can't count on jur uh, juridical measures, uh, uh, efforts through the courts to hold people accountable, well, we should think about how we can get these corporations and financial institutions to make it as part of their business calculations that bad uh, attention for them as a result of not a killing, but the very threatening of a human rights defender in the early stages, a preemptive measure that the corporations could take, that the, that the investors can take, that the private sector can take, preemptive measures can help ensure not only that perhaps their projects can go forward unabated or, or without you know, scrutiny from the fact that somebody like Berta gets killed, but can also help protect a human rights defender. Now, I have to acknowledge and recognize, and, and I put this forward in my article, that what I'm talking about here is not necessarily the overall impact of a project on the environment or the overall best practices in terms of human rights of a corporate actor. What I'm talking about is the most egregious form of violence that human rights defenders are facing, killing or other serious uh, violence against them, and how we can eliminate that element from this dynamic that is existing and that seems to be expanding around the world in, in, in what some have seen as almost a kind of you know, uh, 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 virus that's kind of expanding how actors seem to be learning from each other, the, the ability they have to kill off human rights defenders. Stopping this seems to be something critically important if we're even going to start getting to some of these other measures that we want to get to. And in doing so, I think that we can change the count by, by getting corporations and investors and other private sector actors to put forward to their local partners that certain things are unacceptable, that certain measures threatening human rights defenders, defaming them, uh, using violence against them are off limits, are a red line, that would change the calculations that perpetrators have on the ground. I feel fairly confident without knowing any more than anybody else on this call that the perpetrators in Honduras who killed Hondo uh, Bertha Cateras, not just the people who pulled the trigger, but the ones who authored the crime, uh, the term that we use, the ones who came up with the idea to kill her, never for a minute thought that their, the funding for the Aguazarca project would be withdrawn if she was eliminated because they had experience of killing other human rights defenders and seeing no consequences. That to me spells uh, that, there, that, there were, that there was a failure. There was a failure not just by these uh, investors to make it clear to the local actors that such actions would not be tolerated, but really a failure on all of us as well to be able to in, impose that in a way, to get our voice of civil society heard at the level that corporations, investors, private sector, we take into account that we that they need to act in order to set, for lack of a better term, red lines, and establish that there would be consequences for those red lines. If there's not, if we can't count on the Honduran government to impose consequences of arresting people, of investigating, of prosecuting, then we need to find other measures to create consequences that can change the calculations of local actors. By changing those calculations, we can perhaps move one step closer to helping ensure uh, safety and security for human rights defenders. I'm not saying that this is necessarily a success yet, but if we look at the situation of South Africa and the killing of Siko Sife, he was the first on the list of a number of people within the community, his community, who were put on a hit list to be eliminated. Uh, the number two person, Nonle Mbuthema, was just recently a winner, of, uh, a finalist for the Frontline Defenders Award, and she was number two on that list. Yet she has persisted in continuing her struggle and her outspokenness and whatnot and we don't see the same level of threats against her that we had seen previously. She doesn't, she certainly has a concern about her safety and security, 
But and even despite the killing of Siko Sifi, when I spoke to her in January, uh, she indicated to me that because of the way that civil society acted, the way that there was international solidarity, the pressure that was exerted to remove funding for the project, although again, it's not a perfect story yet, um, she feels more confident and more supported to be able to go out and do it. And, and she feels that the perpetrators are less likely to carry out violence against her because there were economic consequences as a result of the killing that they perpetrated. My argument is simply, in, in the case that I'm making in my article, and I, uh, I'm happy for a discussion on this, is that we can step up our efforts to get those red lines drawn before people are killed. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much, Adam. And um, I, I really hope we'll have enough time for the for Q and A, especially on this really important question of how we um, engage more effectively with institutional investors on some of those projects before um, activists are are are, are murdered and, and killed. Uh, just if I just can make a quick announcement here that uh, Civicus is looking also into ways in which we can have more effective protection mechanisms in place for um, human rights, land or environmental defenders. And we've just established this um, network called VUCA, which uh, we hope is going to um, provide a platform for um, an international solidarity network um, addressing specifically safety and security of, of activists on the ground. All right, let me now turn uh, to our um, uh, fourth uh, presenter, so Uwe Gneiting, who's a research and policy advisor for the private sector department at Oxfam America. And Uwe will be speaking about his essay contribution on the private sector and the sustainable development goals, so switching slightly um, to a, a different theme, that of private sector's engagement in international development, financing for development, and the SDGs. Uwe, the floor is yours, and I, I'd like to ask you to keep it um, shorter than five minutes so that we have time for a, a, a discussion with the participants afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for having me um, on this webinar. Um, I will try to be as short as I can. Um, I know a little bit over time. So um, just a few top line remarks uh, regarding the essay um, that we wrote. And maybe before I do that, just a quick comment on, um, sorry, I hope you guys can, can you guys see me? Uh, no yet. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, yes. sorry for that. Um, so yeah, maybe just a quick uh, comment on, on, on Oxfam's work um, in this area. So um, as was just mentioned, I work in Oxfam's private sector department, and which is a department that was set up approximately a decade ago to help shape the evolving role of the private sector in development, both through campaigning against companies um, when we see the need, but also through engaging collaboratively um, with them when we can. And, and I think it's fair to say that over these past few years, there has been kind of this, this growing concern within, within Oxfam about um, the, the growing divergence um, with regards to the ever-increasing expectations we, we, we place on business as development actors and the, the frameworks and proposals that exist to guide business behavior in, in that area. And, and, and arguably, that gap is nowhere greater than when it comes to the SDGs, which is why a few colleagues and I wrote a paper recently to highlight that gap between uh, those expectations set on the private sector and the, and the, um, the guidance that exists um, for business. The paper is called Raising the Bar. Um, it's available on the Oxfam website, who is interested. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the key points made in that paper, which also are made in the essay, um, uh, in the Civic, Civicus essay. Um, Three quick points. The first one, what are the implications on the SDGs in terms of the private sector's role as development actor, particularly from a civil society lens? What are the implications for civil society? Second, how can the SDGs be harnessed by civil society to influence the private sector? And third, what can civil society actually do to achieve this? Um, so on the first question, I think it's, it's really difficult to overstate um, the significance of the SDGs in terms of illustrating and establishing a new development paradigm, right, in which the private sector plays a central role. Um, I think it's it's a quite a contrast to the MDGs, right, where the private sector had 
um, where the Pirates didn't have as much of a dominant role, both in shaping the development of the goals, but also in considered um, being a key actor in implementing them. Um, and I think what's important to note here is that it's, it's, the assumed contribution goes way beyond the private sector's traditional contributions of economic growth, job creation, et cetera, but it's really assumed that, that there's the capability of the private sector to make purposeful uh, sustainable development contributions around a range of issues from human rights to climate change um, or, or labor issues. And um, what I, we argue in the paper and, and also in the essay, I think that there are three key challenges that have come with this elevated role of the private sector, apart from the opportunities that also, that also exist. Um, the first one is what I would call the kind of the agenda setting challenge, right? And what, what issues are being prioritized in the SDGs as they're being implemented and through what means are they being, being implemented? Uh, I think we're seeing that the current way business is engaging is the SDGs is through looking at them through, through a business case lens. Um, this is, I would argue, nowhere more visible than in the recent report of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, which identifies a $12 trillion market opportunity for business um, in the SDGs. And, and, and there's a key problem, right, with, with this approach of, of business using a business case lens and when it comes to SDGs. And, 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 and particularly since that doesn't coincide with the priorities that I would argue civil society has. And on, the, on the one hand, it, it clearly leads to what we call cherry picking uh, in the sense that issues are selected by companies to engage on the SDGs that are based on their business, on, on the impact on business and not on the SDGs. Um, I think inequality is a good example here where um, clearly it, it has remained and, and surveys have shown that, that that it's one of the SDGs that has gathered very little um, attention by business as an area of priority, um, but clearly is an area where, where business has a lot of impact um, on inequality trends, both through their employment practices, but also through issues of taxation, for example. The second challenge is around accountability, right? Who ensures that business is accountable for its SDG contributions? Um, and I think there it's, it's, it's really clear, there's a clear gap between the expectations that we're placing on business and the actual accountability mechanisms that are in place to ensure that these expectations are met without causing any harms. Um, interestingly, I, I believe that there's an interesting disconnect that we're seeing between the SDGs and the business human rights field, including the UN guiding principles, um, which, which have been relatively sidelined in the SDGs so far. Um, and so in a way, the SDGs, at least in, the, in their current form, are, are almost can be seen as potentially a threat to um, greater traction on the business human rights agenda. And the last challenge I just want to quickly highlight is the, um, the partnership challenge, um, which, which the idea that the SDGs are best achieved in partnership between multiple stakeholders um, clearly poses challenges to civil society in terms of you know, involuntary um, greenwashing, chilling effects on more critical approaches or, or moderating um, of change ambitions, um, which are some of the things that Andrew already highlighted. <clears throat> I think I'm probably out of time already. I just want to make one, one quick final comment. So the paper lies out an alternative approach of how we can potentially see um, business um, role in the SDGs. And I think for civil society that, that, that requires a, a, a commitment to devote the adequate resources in supporting the SDGs implementation and shape the role that business has in the process. I, I would argue that civil society has played a very um, significant role in shaping uh, the Agenda 2030 and the related financing for development debate. However, that it, there seems to be a drop off in momentum around civil society's um, engagement around, around these issues. And, and I would very much like to encourage um, uh, others to, 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 uh, to have a conversation around what should civil society's role be in shaping the role of business as the SDGs are being implemented. Um, I, I, on a personal level, I, I feel like the question if and how to engage with the private sector continues to be one of the most divisive questions for us as civil society and oftentimes forming a key barrier to, to more concerted um, civil society action. And, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that the, the joint vision of the SDGs can maybe be an avenue where we uh, help um, overcome these barriers um, and, and have a conversation of how, how we can have unified yet diverse approaches um, that shape the, the role of business in the SDGs. Um, I leave it here and look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yve. Um And I'm, I am now turning to our um, 
fifth and last uh, presenter, Gretchen Gordon, um, after which I, I'm promising all of you will open up for uh, a discussion. Uh, so Gretchen is the coordinator of the Coalition for Human Rights and Development, uh, which is a, a global coalition of member organizations working um, specifically on development finance institutions to ensure that they respect and, and protect uh, human rights. And Gretchen will be uh, discussing her essay in the report, which is on the private sector in development, new challenges for human rights and civil society. Gretchen, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, it's great to be here. So I'm going to jump right in since we're short in time, um, but it's a great segue from uh, Uwe's comments that the private sector is playing a dramatically new and expanded role in, in development and development finance. And, and this is not just as a financier of development, but also increasingly as a development implementer, as a recipient of, of public development dollars. So I'm focused a little bit more on development banks. And, and development banks are also shifting their role. They're moving from directly financing projects to instead leveraging private sector investment. And this is, this is a new development paradigm called the billions to trillions paradigm. And it uh, has a simple logic. So to meet the SDGs, we need trillions of dollars. The public sector doesn't have that money, but the private sector does. However, businesses are reluctant to invest in developing and emerging markets, so the billions available in public finance will need to be utilized to leverage the trillions available from the private sector. And the way you leverage that is either by sweetening the deal um, for the private investors or decreasing their investment risk. So unfortunately, the, this new paradigm has not been publicly debated, so it's, it's useful for us as civil society to, to unpack it a bit. So first, we can look at what kind of development is being financed through this model. The pivot towards the private sector coincides with an unprecedented boom in infrastructure, especially large-scale mega projects in mining, energy, transport, water, communications. And unfortunately, as some colleagues have mentioned, more money, more construction doesn't necessarily mean better development or, or social outcomes. For instance, much of the energy infrastructure boom in Africa and Latin America is geared not towards meeting public need for electricity, but toward enabling mining and other extractive industries. Similarly, you know, when the, the private sector uh, drives development, critical priorities such as equity or serving low-income populations tend to, tend to lose out. Another lens that's useful to look at is how is this development being financed through this, through this model? Increasingly, there's, there's less distinction between public development and private investment. They're, they're commingled in what's often termed as blended finance. So on the one hand, you might have de public development banks uh, using equity investments in private companies. You'll also have public development banks promoting public-private partnerships from everything to from, from health and education to infrastructure. Another strategy is lending through financial intermediaries, such as private banks. And each of these strategies you know, can have some positive impacts, but can also have some significant negative impacts on transparency and accountability. For instance, it's much harder for an impacted community to know who is financing a given project or to, or to hold them accountable to international standards. And most importantly, the way that this leveraging of public finance is happening is by facilitating an enabling environment for business, so favorable legal and regulatory environments in, in client countries. Around the world, we see countries weakening their social and environmental protections from whether it's labor laws or regulations on environmental licensing, all in an effort to attract uh, investment and speed up development. And too often development banks are supporting these deregulatory efforts. So we see social protections being weakened at the same time as there's an increasing obstacles to transparency and accountability. And that is not a good um, recipe. So at its core, the challenge with this private sector involvement, uh, new involvement in development is not the involvement itself, 
but rather critical questions of who determines the appropriate role for the private sector, who sets the priorities um, or the terms for, for each nation or each community's development, and who benefits and, and who bears the risk. In terms of how civil society is responding to the new paradigm, par paradigm at the coalition, we see with our members and allies that, that they're employing a diversity of tactics. One key area is supporting communities and grassroots groups to overcome obstacles to access to information and access to decision making so that they can get in and influence development upstream. So while the billions to trillions paradigm stresses the need for an enabling environment for private investment in development, we're focused on building an enabling environment for public participation in, in development. Another area of work is around human rights due diligence. And this is somewhere where the, the private sector has been more advanced than the public sector development banks, making sure that all development actors um, are identifying and addressing potential human rights risks. As Adam mentioned in the case of Berta Caceres and countless others, these human rights risks, restrictions on fundamental freedoms and civil society space, attacks on defenders could have been anticipated and, and avoided. So together with several of the groups on, on the call today, um, we've launched a global campaign to press development financiers to address risks associated with civil society space restrictions and uh, attacks on defenders and also to support defenders, as the other side of the coin, to be able to leverage development financiers, to leverage their standards, their accountability mechanisms to decrease, decrease risks and to, to bring remedy. So there are a diversity of strategies that are being employed by civil society groups to challenge this new paradigm. And, and I think that's what it's going to take. We need to approach this challenge from different angles, but in a coordinated manner. And in particular, break down some of the silos between tra traditional silos between the human rights world, the environmental world, the corporate accountability world, the transparency world, the development world and bring all those groups together to have a united front for expanding the enabling environment for participatory and rights respecting development. Great, thank you very much, Gretchen. And I hope you, you can remain um, with us for the, for the Q&A. So um, thank you all for your uh, patience. Uh, I know we're running about half an hour late, but we are able to remain on, on the line um, until, um, um, you know, for, for another extra half hour, uh, if you are able to, to stay on with us. Um, a couple of our presenters, unfortunately, had to leave already, but uh, what I'm going to do now is um, throw the, the, the four questions we've received from participants um, to each of the three presenters who I believe are still on the line. So that's Anna, Uwe, and Gretchen. So we've received four questions. I'll just um, go through those four and then uh, throw them back to you and you can pick and choose which ones you want to address. Uh, so the first question is related to... Um, hello? Is that okay? All right, so the first question we've received in writing in the conversation box um, is related to greenwashing or using corporate social responsibility as a PR exercise rather than as a genuine um, commitment by the private sector to do business differently. Um, so in that context, the question is how can we actually um, um, trust that those companies uh, can be genuine partners in prom promoting sustainable development. So that's the first question. A second question from a participant from Lebanon was around the capture of the state by private interest and the kind of conflation between the ruling system and, and uh, private uh, corporate entities. and. Um, how to, you know, how can civil society address that corporate capture of the public interest? Was the question from our participant uh, from Lebanon. A third question was related to the UN specifically, um, and 
about what were the, in your views, the main negative impacts of increasing private sector engagement in the UN system, be it through financing of the SDGs or uh, via other mechanisms such as the UN Global Compact or just generally uh, higher ac access to the UN system by uh, private interest and how can civil society effectively mitigate those effects? And the fourth and last question um, was regarding the role of the public sector, so the role of the state in ensuring that the private sector respects human rights. And I think that kind of speaks directly to what Gretchen was saying that in a, you know, in a context of somewhat of a race to the bottom by many developing country governments to attract private and public investment, um, how can civil society ensure that um, you know, human rights and public participation um, are, are part of that conversation around what the jargon calls the enabling environment for investment. So those are the four questions. Um, I'll just open the line to participants, please. If those of you have not been able to write your question but have a burning question that you'd like to ask orally now, please do so now. Hey, it's Saira from Civicus, and just to, to note, we have two more questions coming up in the chat box now after those initial questions. So perhaps we can do a round with the panelists and then come back to um, Kahal and Chip's questions then. Yeah, I saw those questions. So let's see if um, if we have time to, to, to take them. So let's, I'm turning now to Anna and Uwe and Gretchen to address those four first questions. Please, Anna, start with one or two that you're feeling most comfortable with, and hopefully the others, Uwe and Gretchen, can pick up on, the, on those that you haven't addressed. Please do not address every single one of them because we don't have time for that. I definitely, I definitely won't, won't address them. I'll just, I'll just uh, maybe, uh, maybe focus, focus on, on my camera. My camera. So, uh, um, yeah, I think I'm, think going, I'm going to focus, focus on the on, one on, about, about Lebanon. Lebanon. Uh, it's uh, not, not that I have any kind of, kind of great expertise, great expertise on Lebanon, Lebanon unfortunately, unfortunately, but, but I, can I can relate to it. it. Perhaps when you bring it to the case of uh, Rafael Marquez, Marquez and, and, and see if there can be some, some lessons learned from there. there. So, obviously, obviously when, when, when Rafael, Rafael was, was uh, when, uh, he when he faced the election charges, charges, they were, they were brought by, by a woman and generals and general their business, business associates, associates over, over booking books, 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 books um, alleging um, abuses abuse in the diamond industry that they were involved in. And so and we so see, we see the, 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 a big a level of collusion there. there. And, and what, what we found, found interesting, interesting was, was that, that Tiffany & Co., which was, was a company that wasn't invested in gold at the time, didn't, didn't work this play not, play not starting from there, from there. Decided, decided to speak up, up uh, uh, in, uh, support in support of, of Rafael, Rafael and, and according, according to, to, to him, him that did have, have, have an impact on him, on him a more, a more lenient, lenient sentence or so sentence than nine, nine years, years, years in general. general. So, so perhaps, perhaps there's, there's a role, a role for companies, companies that are not that are really really uh, uh, invested invest in, in, in those, in those contexts, there, but would but want, want to, to speak up, speak up and, and against, against abuses as, as means, means of, of keeping their, their, their entire industries or sectors, sectors uh, cleaner, cleaner or, or, so they would they have, have that. It's true it's that that's, that's quite, that that's quite, quite an isolated, isolated example, example, but perhaps I can give some, some thought, thought. Anna? Yes? Yes? Sorry, the, your your sound is um, there's a there's a big echo. Um, can can you check your your sound card or your sound system? It it's not it's not good. Oh, apologies, it's better at all. Okay, let me move on to um, Uve while you you try. Sorry about that, but it's very very hard to understand what you're saying. So. Let me move to Uwe and, and please be in contact with, um, you know, offline um, with the, the organizers on, of the call to see if you can, um, you can solve your sound system and I'll come back to you afterwards. 
So, Uwe, um, among those four questions, could you, you know, please address one of them? Yes, absolutely. I mean, all of them are great questions. Um, I will focus real quickly on the on the question of greenwashing and 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 corporate social responsibility. Um, I, I think it's a key question, one that that we've been struggling with for a long time uh, around what to do with, you know, if you want to call it the um, the CSR movement. I think there was a lot of the hopes that I think NGOs and and other um, campaigners have had in the past around CSR have been disappointed over the past 15 years. But the question is what to do with it now, and and I think there. That, that risk of greenwashing clearly exists at the same time. I think at least at Oxfam, we're trying to come to grips with, with what the value of CSR still is. And I think it has some value when we think about areas, for example, where there is no standard at all at the moment and uh, where, where certain, you know, voluntary commitments by companies can actually play a role in changing kind of the overall expectation on what um, the responsibility of business is. And um, second of all, we're seeing voluntary standards increasingly just as a transitional tool. Uh, we don't see them as an end all, and we are based on the, on the experience we have had with with, with their impacts. Um, but we're seeing it as a potential transitional tool for more binding regulation um, around business. Um, and 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 I mean the, that theory of change behind that is still to be tested, but but it's it's one. Um, that's um, being debated. Real quickly on the question of political capture, um, clearly becoming a, a key issue um, and a clear focus, the political influence um, of the role of business as part of their um, as part of their d development impact. And I think while capture is a clear challenge, there is, of course, also increasingly the, the possibility of harnessing the political power of the private sector around issues um, such as climate change, for example, just now in the US when, when we have seen business step up around such issues. So I'm just highlighting that the, that the political role of business um, is, is kind of a two-sided two coin, and it's, it's a challenge for civil society to figure out when to harness it and when to address it. Great. Thank you, Uwe. Gretchen? Thanks. Um, so addressing the question about, you know, what is the, the role of the public sector or of donors in, in, in ensuring respect for human rights? So first of all, it's, it's to not fuel, to stop fueling abuses or conflicts, start, stop, uh, you know, adding, adding uh, dollars to tenuous situations, um, which can lead to attacks on defenders, etc. But in, if we look at also a more proactive uh, engagement towards supporting an enabling environment. There's a lot that donors can do in terms of they, they provide their technical assistance, diplomacy, lending, policy reform. All of these should be supporting an enabling environment for participatory development. They should be working to build the capacity of their clients, both the public and private sector, to do better, more meaningful, effective consultation, better access to information, due diligence. Um, they can also be promoting participatory processes, so participatory development planning, participatory monitoring. And then, of course, when threats or attacks occur, it's really important that donors are responding strongly and publicly. We've seen a little bit of this. We've seen in cases in, in Cambodia or Chad where, where development bank leadership has spoken out to press for the release of someone detained in connection with a, a development related protest or has spoken out to say, look, you know, protests are a part of the development process. And this environment for people to express their opinions about development is beneficial. And that can have a really strong impact um, for, for folks who are, at, who are at risk. Unfortunately, we don't see enough of that. It's, it's the rare occasion that that takes place presently. But that's why we need, have a lot of work to do. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. So unfortunately, I cannot go back to Anna because she's had to leave the call. Um, so we have Uwe and Gretchen left as contributors to this year's Civic State of Civil Society report. I believe that there's actually an, uh, another author um, who's participating um, on this call, and that's uh, Chip uh, Pitts. Chip, do you want to ask a, a question or have um, a, a few words of reflection uh, from your experience uh, of those issues? 
Um, I firstly have to make him a presenter before. Anas Bona is now exiting. Okay, so he's now a presenter. Chip, I think you can go ahead if you if you want to say a few words and or ask a question. Hello, Chip, are, are you still there? Um, okay, I see he's muted, uh, but no response. Okay, so let me take another question in the meantime. There was a very interesting que uh, question on um, the development model. So we, we've been talking about the role of um, the, the private sector in upholding the rule of law and respecting human rights, uh, contributing to sustainable and equitable development. But we haven't really addressed one of the fundamental questions that Cathal is, um, Gilbert is, is asking, which is that, um, can, so can those issues we've discussed be systematically addressed without examining the economic models which have allowed for an unprecedented concentration of wealth in the hands of a few and rising, um, and rising inequality and exclusion? Um, or can sustainable solutions be found within a market-based system? And I think in a way that question is very much um, at, uh, at the center of uh, what we are all recognizing as a, a rather divisive question uh, in civil society, whether or not to engage with the private sector and how to do that. Um, so I'd love to hear from Adam, from Gretchen, or from Chip, if he's able to um, share his reflections on, on that question. So are we, you know, are we actually addressing um, the root causes of, uh, you know, corporate power and everything that comes with it, um, or do we need to kind of more fundamentally speak of the type of development model we want and and what what role for corporations in that uh, development model? Um, Uwe, do you want to go first, and then Gretchen, and then Chip? Yes, sure. I mean, I only have a couple of quick comments on that. <laughs> the overarching being, yes, absolutely. I think those are the discussions that we should be having, and, and there is, I think, a risk that these discussions are being sidelined by um, particularly large multinationals sitting, you know, at the tables um, at, 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 at the, the key negotiations forums and, and thereby kind of sidelining more fundamental questions about developing models. Oxfam, um, of course, is, is focusing on inequality as a key issue that we're concerned about, and we are um, thereby looking at what are, you know, alternative uh, business models and, and what are the structural barriers that prevent a more equitable um, distribution of, of wealth in the societies we live in. So, yes, I think I would say um, absolutely, and I think oftentimes civil society campaigners, we ourselves make the mistake of focusing too much on you know the usual suspects as you know large Western multinationals as the key targets of our work, when we should potentially be looking at you know what are the next business leaders, what are alternative uh, models um, that we should be promoting instead of um, focusing on the existing ones. Thank you, uh, Gretchen. I would definitely agree that we have to be questioning the development model and working to change it. Otherwise, we're you know we can put some window dressing on this, but we're not going to change the impact for for affected communities unless we get at the at the core model. Um, but I think part of that is looking at who who is making the decisions here. Is is development is economic development a product of who has the dollars can decide, or is it a product of who's going to be impacted can decide? And we need to shift that dynamic and make sure that those who are most impacted by development, those who are, are most vulnerable or most at need, are the ones making the decisions. And that, of course, is not an easy flip to make, but it's a really fundamental one. Um, great. Chip, are you still not able to be heard? I'm just checking one last time with you.
All right. Okay. So hopefully you're still able to hear us. Uh, so Chip had a question actually, um, uh, specifically for Uwe, but also others, uh, to please elaborate on the precise a problem was. This is Chip. Oh, <laughs> great. I don't know if you can you see can me or you can hear me at least. And I just wanted to comment. I think uh, the questions that were asked by uh, the participants and the points made by Katel, Gilbert, et cetera, about the, the need to question our assumptions, to look for a more equitable globalization, more equitable market-based solutions, uh, they're consonant, consistent with rights based development of the sort that are promoted, you know, uh, that is promoted by Oxfam, by BRAC, uh, you know, by the UN agencies and so forth. I think that's what we need to do. I do believe we are at risk if we take too excessively ideological a posture of having um, positions that hurt uh, sustainable development. So, yes, we need to harmonize the SDGs with business and human rights, with legal accountability mechanisms, and economic, social, cultural rights in particular, because they've been relatively neglected. But for example, for us to have neo-isolationism, protectionism that hurts trade and to not reform trade to make it more fair would, I think, quite, quite clearly hurt uh, development prospects as an empirical matter. So I think we need to look for constant questioning of, and refinement of models but not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Excellent, thank you, Chip. So I think we need to round up that conversation. Um, I, so I'm going to turn to, well, Chip stays with us, stay with us, maybe uh, the three remaining authors, if you have concluding remarks you'd like to share or anything that we haven't addressed you think that um, needs to be put on the table just like two minutes each of concluding remarks please so starting with Uwe and then Gretchen and then Chip thank you um I just want to say thank you for the organizers for this. This was a really interesting discussion. Um, quickly on Chip's last question around um, the, the the sidelining of human rights within the SDGs. I think it's an ongoing debate. I think it, it goes to the to the notion that business likes to focusing on the doing more good versus civil society urging business to do less harm, which is you know more and more explicit human rights approach um, and I think we, we see that in, in, in terms of several standing standard setting um, processes on the way right now in the SDGs where, where the, the idea of uh, due diligence and, and human rights impact um, are, are, are less prioritized um, than for example issues of materiality where, where business focuses on financial risk and return. Anyways, but it's a broad discussion. But the other point I just wanted to quickly make is I think this is a, such an important issue for civil society what to do with the private sector and I would, I would be very interested from, from Oxfam's perspective to continue this conversation um, around, you know, exchanging experiences, formulating um, perspectives and, and positions around how to best shape um, uh, and influence the private sector and engage with the private sector, not only SDGs, but more generally. So if there's interest, um, I would be very interested from Oxfam to, to contrib contribute. Great. Thank you. Gretchen? Sure. Well, thanks very much for the for the discussion. I guess just to to conclude, I I think that a lot of times we are stuck in in the human rights world and the development world in in responding to agendas set by others, set by the private sector or set by states. And I think there's an opportunity for civil society to put forward some proactive agendas and. And as I was mentioning before, to really place communities at the forefront of decision making about issues that will will impact them. So while the situation may look grim, if we just look at the opportunities, the windows of opportunities created by these institutions or kind of the dialogues that they are permitting um, to happen, I think if we take a step back and think about what's the development vision that we would like, what is the role for human rights and development, then we can put forward much more robust mm -hmm. and effective uh, solutions for, for some of these challenges. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, Chip, do you want to add a few words? 
Sure. And I must confess, I had technical difficulties at the beginning, so missed uh, what I'm sure was an excellent presentation by Andrew and, and any other comments on this from early participants. But I think we, if we haven't taken into account the very scary context in which we operate today, you know, with um, a very real risk that globalization, not just its, its negative side of increasing inequality, as Paquetti pointed out, along with others, but the, the positive side of, of recognizing the very real interdependency, our common humanity, universal human rights, uh, allowing civil society activism effectively across borders, you know, that's at risk too, because we're going to have, again, you know, new uh, a new divergence of societies with the climate of autocratic, uh, you know, populist, you know, like in my own country, country with President Trump or so many others that we see around the world. So I think as is happening in the United States in response to, uh, you know, this this particular rights problematic uh, president we have, you know, there is a lot of activism that's being generated to recognize the central role of economic, social, cultural rights, uh, you know, that, that basically sustain a lot of these autocrats and how by working together effectively, both within and across borders, we can actually have empowered, uh, you know, communities that, that for a change, you know, get access to the natural resources that are, are part of their heritage, get, get common action on common threats like climate change and, and, you know, take effective approaches, both in the substance of rights, the full spectrum of rights, not just civil and political, but economic, social, cultural, but also the processes that we've been talking about on this call, you know, the, the crucial imperatives of transparency and accountability. So I believe that we all need to work for those, avoid the lure of, a, you know, excessively uh, ideological or utopian solutions that don't recognize the power of the market to contribute to, uh, you know, to human centered development, but, but balance that recognition with the crucial emphasis on legal accountability and the social, uh, you know, advocacy techniques that civil society pioneers so that we can, we can actually make the real progress we need to make. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think it's been an amazing conversation. Uh, so I'd like to thank Civicus, of course, the staff, as well as uh, Danny and Andrew for and Sarah for and all the others, Mika, to organize the, the call. Uh, thank you also very much for all those of you authors who were able to make the time to participate in that webinar. So Anna, Michael, Adam, Uwe, Gretchen, uh, all of you, thank you so much for your insightful um, um, take on, on the issue of the, the private sector and, and civic space. And as I said at the beginning, the quality of the report is, is really remarkable, and I think we at Civicus have, have gone a long way in making those reports um, based on evidence and really making the case for, for civic space and the respect of human rights around the world. I think what comes out very clearly from the conversation of, and, and from the, the whole report is that I think the question is not if, but how um, the private sector can help defend the space for civil society and how we as civil society can accelerate and increase the number of companies that speak out against governments that target um, activists, uh, but also in support of increasing um, binding business regulations. Um, so that we, you know, we turn what I think Uwe or, or um, was it maybe um, Michael um, called increased sensitivity, increased um, awareness really in the private sector of the importance of upholding human rights in, in the region and the countries in which they operate. And, and kind of like scale that up so that companies are also um, obligated legally to uphold um, human rights in the regions and, and the countries and communities in which they work. Um, I think another, you know, and, and I'll leave it at there, one, one key message is, is that the report also definitely asked the private sector to go beyond the do no harm principle. Um, I think within civil society at large, we see that as, as, as the very minimum 
principle that needs to be respected by uh, private players, uh, um, um, but they need to, you know, go much further than that and, and, and be actively committed to work with civil society to uphold the rule of law, human rights, and, and generally people's right to uh, free expression and association and, and peaceful assembly. Um, I think I need to make a few announcements, but I'm not sure what they are. So Sarah, can I, can I give you the floor to make those announcements? Um, well, there's just a, a general announcement for, for all the members that there's going to be board elections coming up. So we were just going to share that. Um, more specifically, also, Anna from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center had a resource that she had asked us to share that focuses on this very topic. So I'm going to share the link in the chat box right now for anybody who's interested. Uh, and finally, the, the recording of the event is going to go up on the Civicus YouTube channel in the coming days. So we'll share that link in our communications uh, with members and subscribers. And there's also going to be inf information on a, um, a Human Rights Council side event coming up next week. So keep following the Civicus communications channels to get more details on all of that. And thank you very much to everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, everyone, and apologies again for the delay. Uh, thank you for all those who stayed on for another uh, 20 minutes. Have, have a great day, everyone. You too, thank you. Thank you from Civicus House.